Hi, I'm Dick Keller, and I put together this film over a period of time about my project, the, the Blue Flame Land Speed Record. The opening scene shows the X-1 prototype rocket dragster running at Rockford Dragway in 1967 with Chuck Suba driving it. I worked at IIT Research Institute along with Ray Dousman. I had the, available to me the facility at IIT Research Institute machine shop. And since I had a drag racing background, I was kind of telling him all about, you know, my adventures with Don Garlitz. But he thought that was a tremendous waste of energy burning the tires and all that stuff and that we could do a lot, fa do it a lot faster with a rocket by building a 25 pound thrust prototype rocket. And after that, we had proven it, we then started working on a 2,500 pound thrust rocket for the dragster. So after seeing that we had scaled up the 25-pound thrust 100 times for the X-1 dragster, we realized to go faster in the blue flame, we needed to scale it up 1,000 times. So we would introduce liquefied natural gas as a fuel to burn with the hydrogen peroxide as the oxidizer. Ray Dousman and I then were assembling the catalyst pack into the rocket uh, uh, decomposition chamber. This is Ray Dousman uh, putting the silver, the plated silver screens into the rocket uh, combustion or uh, decomposition chamber. This is me hiding behind the press there, put, putting the uh, support plate on. We had to press the catalyst pack to. Uh, uh, make sure that it wouldn't loosen up when we were running the rocket on the 2,500 pound thrust X1 motor. Meanwhile, Pete was up in Milwaukee beginning to build the X1 chassis. Pete's gas welding the chromoly tubes for the frame. And we built this in the garage behind his house. Pete uh, actually had built several dragsters and I got to know him uh, several years before uh, because we were hanging around Chuck Suba. So we were building this chassis using uh, chromoly uh, tubing. It was a kind of a conventional construction method at the time. But later when we got into the, into the blue flame, it was going to be a monocoque construction uh, similar to modern aircraft. Here he's looking at the front suspension. We de I designed the... X1 Dragster to have four-wheel suspension. It was actually designed to look and behave more or less like a Formula One car. When we decided to build a rocket Dragster, the first question is, what should it look like? Well, my thought was it needs to handle well so that if, if it uh, starts to move around on the track, we can control it. Well, Pete is tying the uh, X1 down with chains so that we can do some static testing at the back of the chassis. We have two uh, horizontal cans for parachutes and one that's up at a 45 degree angle. We believe it's more important to know how to stop than to go fast. And so the idea was to fire the two uh, horizontal cans, uh, parachutes, uh, normally. And then in an emergency, we had a much larger ribbon shoot coming out of that can at 45 degrees. You can see the rocket nozzle in the back there. And then right behind the roll bar is the hydrogen peroxide tank, and you can see the little spheres up front that have uh, compressed nitrogen in them. So here we're using the hand control to test fire the rocket. This is the first time that we were firing it. And I'm the test dummy, and I'm really nervous lighting this thing up for the first time. Then uh, the idea here is to show that we can control the rocket and stage it like a regular dragster. We didn't want people to think you lit the fuse and ran like hell, uh, you know, like with a firework. This thing is con totally controllable, just like a, a piston engine. I didn't go too fast on these uh, two test runs because we had no parachutes on the car. And they were the first time we ran the car. So... I was just relying on the brakes to stop it. That was in May of 1966. In September, we were out to uh, Great Lakes Dragway again, and by then Chuck Suba had decided he would 
drive the car for us and with the idea that he would also be the driver for the land speed. Uh, Pete and I had known Chuck for many years. Uh, Pete and Chuck went to Evanston Township High School. I went to St. George High School in Evanston. And Chuck had a, a nice machine shop and chassis shop behind his house in Evanston, his father's house. And a bunch of us racers used to hang out there all the time. So uh, it was kind of a natural thing that uh, when we decided – that I was not capable of handling this thing at high speed, that Chuck became the the one, that, the person we would ask to drive it. Chuck actually owned two jet dragsters at the time, and uh, his partner uh, with his back to us uh, in the striped shirt, Jake Shulak, was kind of dismayed because when Chuck started driving this, he decided that, uh, as he said, jets suck. <laughs> he wanted to drive the rocket. Uh, so this is a, these are the first runs that Chuck made in the car in uh, September of 1966. And even without the body, we got this thing to almost seven seconds flat and 203 miles an hour, which was faster than any dragster at that time. So this, these were the first runs that we actually had on the car where we could go fast because we had the parachutes. And Chuck was learning a little bit about it. We had four four wheel suspension on it, and after these runs, we decided to make it solid at the back. We didn't want it to get airborne for obvious reasons. And here we are back at our favorite drag strip, <laughs> Union Grove. So Chuck can uh, get some uh, runs in with the with the body on, which was much easier for him because you didn't have the wind blowing on them at 200 miles an hour. Also, it was more streamlined, so it potentially could go faster. Reaction Dynamics was a company that uh, Ray Dallasman, Pete Farnsworth, and I started really focused on this project and uh, getting the sponsorship to build the Blue Flame. Chuck's uh, going to be wearing a regular fire suit just in case he gets some hydrogen peroxide sprayed on him. And we don't expect a fire, but... Uh, it is impermeable to the hydrogen peroxide. Here he's ready to go on the first run with the uh, body on it. You can see we put some scoops on the side of the car so that we would get more air going to the back of the car to fill the chutes. Packing the parachutes, uh, I always made sure that Chuck was doing that. I, I wanted to make sure if the parachute didn't open, he was the guy that did it. So... We, he had, we had the two uh, primary chutes laid out there. Here he's packing them into the uh, small chute cans. That's Phil Rosine that's helping put the body panels on. Here you can see him loading the, the small eight-foot ribbon chutes into the cans. This is at uh, Route, uh, Route 30 drag strip in uh, Indiana, Crown Point, Indiana. Now we're getting ready to start. That's Ray Dousman and Pete Farnsworth. On this run, the uh, car was timed at an ET of 5.41 seconds, which caused a lot of problems for us as we went on. We think that was an incorrect ET, but what, what the result of that was we had trouble getting jet cars to race against us because we were so much quicker. This was the last time we ran the X1. This was uh, in 1968, September, or uh, yeah, September of 1968 at the Oklahoma City Dragway. They had a big jet car uh, race there, and we were invited to come. There's Chuck looking at the car as we're, get, as we're preparing it. This thing took a lot longer to do because we were doing it with our lunch money. <laughs> the significant thing about this particular event, besides it was the last time we ran the X1, was we had a big meeting in you can see the guys in the suits. These are all gas industry executives. 
and they were there to see firsthand what we could do with the X1. And they basically agreed at this event to sponsor the, the Blue Flame officially. Here we're fueling the, the X1 with the hydrogen peroxide and pressurizing the uh, nitrogen tanks. So it, during this uh, time period, I was working at the Institute of Gas Technology and because of the enthusiasm of the management at the Institute of Gas Technology, they were able to get behind the project and convince the American Gas Association and uh, about 40 of its members to ultimately sponsor the Blue Flame project. You have to be careful with the hydrogen peroxide. With the, It's a very strong oxidizer, and it'll oxidize your skin. <laughs> This is Art Arfons, who had the world land speed record several times in his jet car, jet dragster. So at the, the neat thing about this particular event was Art Arfons was there as a former re world record holder. This is the Dwayne Landon rocket car, which was actually uh, owned by Walt Arfons, who designed and built it. And it has a uh, steam rocket in it. So we were supposed to race against them, and the idea we had was we had heard this thing was not too stable. So we asked if they would make a single run uh, to prove that it was stable before we would match race them. So here they go on their single run, and, of course, it crashed. So that was the end of the match race. We didn't have another rocket car to run against, and the jet cars wouldn't race against us, which uh, also impressed the gas industry guys when the the former world land speed record holders decided they didn't want to run against the rocket because we were too fast. Military surplus jets running on JP4. Uh, I believe, uh, I think they were using afterburners at this time. Yeah, we actually, at this event, we turned a top speed of 265 miles an hour, much faster than any of these uh, jet cars ever went. And uh, here's the last run of uh, the X1 with Chuck Suba in it. This is when he went 265. We dropped one of the chutes. <laughs> That's why you have two. Here comes Chuck coming back. The tragic thing about this whole scene for me is four, four weeks later, here we had the Blue Flame project finally being sponsored by the gas industry. And all we had to do was start working on that. A month later, Chuck driving a top fuel dragster was killed. So here he was at the, the height of his uh, career, if you will. And uh, he was killed a month later. And it was a big loss for Pete and I since we'd known him since we were in high school. We moved on to uh, design the car. And uh, here we're at the Ohio State University. We're using their transonic wind tunnel. And we needed to... Uh, draft some additional engineering help because this project was a lot bigger than us three could handle ourselves. IIT provided through their mechanical and aerospace engineering department, uh, Dr. T. Paul Torta and his graduate student, Tom Morell, and they were in charge of the aerodynamic end of the design. Here we have the brass model in the wind tunnel. You can see it has fairings over the back tires and a fared strut. What we found out in the wind tunnel testing was this caused dynamic instability pitching and ultimately we redesigned the wheel supports and uh, took off the fairings so that we could eliminate that particular issue. The result was the Blue Flame was probably the best handling world land speed record car ever. We were able to run 
uh, 24 runs with the car, and uh, we had still one of the original tires on it because there was so little tire wear from uh, yawing. Here's Tom Morell, the grad student from IIT, working, who was working with Dr. Paul Tarda in the control room. And you can see all the analog equipment there. As a matter of fact, in these days, we did all the design with pencil and paper. And with slide rules, we had some use of an analog computer, but we certainly didn't have the sophisticated software and digital computers we have today to do the design and the modeling of, of the car. So now we have to move forward to build the blue flame and get that thing out to the salt flats. Here we're at the Great Lakes Dragway preparing to do static testing on the uh, liquid natural gas fueled 22,000 pound thrust motor. The uh, upholstery in the car, by the way, was uh, built, made for us by uh, Chuck Suva's dad. Chuck's dad was a great fan of uh, drag racing, and he upholstered many of our race cars. You can see the uh, compressor we used for compressing the uh, air for the uh, blowdown fuel tanks. And uh, we were getting all of our, our uh, excuse me, our hydrogen peroxide in aluminum drums, 300 pound drums. It took about eight of those to fuel uh, the car with the oxidizer, the hydrogen peroxide. And the liquefied natural gas came in a separate container. So the rocket itself is kind of a unique design. It has uh, three different phases of operation. First phase, it can be run as a monopropellant using hydrogen peroxide, and that's what's in those silver drums there. Second phase, we inject liquefied natural gas into a heat exchanger in the combustion chamber, and then it, it comes out in the gaseous form to burn with the oxygen from the hydrogen peroxide decomposition. Third phase, we inject liquefied natural gas as a liquid farther downstream and then burn that in the high temperature gases in the combustion chamber. But here we're setting up the uh, strain gauge to measure the thrust of the rocket motor. We had some instrumentation that we borrowed from NASA, uh, both for monitoring the rocket testing and then later for uh, monitoring the aerodynamic operation of the vehicle. Here's Dr. Uzgaris getting ready to record the readings on the strain gauge uh, while we're running the rocket. We had the, pro the, the project of recruiting another driver for the Blue Flame. Fortunately, we were able to find Gary Gavlich and uh, his resume was quite uh, convincing. He had uh, experience in a large number of different vehicles, including jet-powered cars and on the salt flats. So as a result, we felt he could adapt quickly to driving a totally different car, such as the Blue Flame. Here's uh, Gary Gavlich in the car, and uh, we're doing the th static testing now. Uh, Gerard Brennan is holding a pressure gauge. Everyone else was running like hell, and Gerard is standing there wondering where everybody went. You can see the uh, car lunging against the uh, cable, and we had a foot throttle in the blue flame, as, whereas we had a hand throttle in the X1. So this is a little bit more sophisticated, but easier to drive. Gary was sure happy to keep both hands on the steering wheel. Here's a night shot of the rocket motor being tested. And you'll see some sparks coming out, and that was the old combustors uh, combusting <laughs> and flying out the tailpipe. So we redesigned the uh, system for igniting the fuel. We ended up using regular spark plugs. Uh, in fact, they were champion spark plugs. 
So on September 14, 1970, we were driving down US 40 out to the salt flats. And we had our crew out there. We're unloading the car. And the first thing we did was we changed the wheel bearings and started working on setting up our instrumentation. We had Drs. Torta, Uzgaris, and Tom Morell with us to take a look at the uh, instruments and uh, monitor what we're doing as we were building up speed. Then we needed to pull the panels off. There, uh, the panels on this car are all stressed panels. And so there's hundreds of screws, as you can see, holding this thing together. So uh, we had to pull all these out in order to get at the, uh, the, the fuel compartment, the peroxide compartment, the front wheel compartment. Also, that nose piece comes off in one piece. And underneath there, we had a couple of titanium spheres for high pressure. That plume in my hat was uh, uh, Gary Gablich's lucky plume. He always had that on when he was drag racing. And since he couldn't wear it in the car, he asked me to wear it to uh, give him good luck. So once we got the panels off, then uh, you can see the fuel, the, the peroxide tank there, and then towards the rear, you see the compartment where the LNG tank is. We had a small LNG tank in there because we could run the engine in, at three different power levels, and we chose to go to the second power level where we didn't. We were running the rocket sort of lean on the LNG. We were sure we could get over 800 miles per hour. And we were actually operating at about about 13,000, 14,000 pounds thrust, and we had a 22,000 pound thrust capability. So we really had uh, dialed it back. Because we had never been to the salt flats before, uh, they didn't want us to just go out there and go bonsai. <laughs> Here, Ken McCarthy, he was our first employee at Reaction Dynamics, uh, is working on getting the wheels put back on after we had uh, replaced the bearings. And here they're putting the brake caliper on. So it was quite time consuming. You can see some of the parachutes in the back, parachute cans in the back there. The parachutes were uh, set up. We had a two-stage chute system. The six-foot diameter chute came out at 600 miles an hour. Then at 300, it pulled out a much larger chute shoot to get us down to about 100 miles an hour, then we could use brakes. So Dr. Osguris has the red jacket on there. Dr. Porta heads back to us. Uh, here's the LNG, which is one of the main reasons we were out there. And yes, we did put it in the car. Some people didn't think we used LNG whatsoever. Here we're doing a, a good job of cleaning up and waxing the car. Uh, we wanted to keep it waxed to prevent, to prevent salt buildup uh, on the exterior, which would also affect the aerodynamics. Here's Gary Gablis checking things out. He had the pitot tube in the front to measure the airspeed, and we had that calibrated by uh, the Air Force while we were out there. Here's Jim Deist working on the parachutes. Then Gary's trying out his uh, fire suit. When the Breedlovs and the Arfons and so forth were setting records, they had to find a surplus jet engine to do the job. And with us, we felt all we had to do was decide how much power we needed. We could build a rocket to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> off we went. So the, the cans on the back of the uh, flatbed there, those are the uh, hydrogen peroxide cans, just like we had uh, at Union Grove Drag Strip. And then that uh, covered wagon there uh, holds the LNG. So you can see it's quite an operation to get this thing refueled and uh, pressurized and ready to go uh, between runs. So 
So it was, it was important for Gary not to bring salt into the car, so we were always making sure his boots were clean when he got in. You can see one of the photographers there from the American Gas Association. And here we're closing up the canopy. Uh, the canopy was uh, screwed on from the outside, but Gary had released from the inside. Dean Dietrich is checking out the wind speed to make sure we're not over six mile an hour crosswind. That was the limit for uh, safety's sake. And Natural Gas Industries, the blue flame, designed and built by Reaction Dynamics. That was Pete and myself. Here we go on one of the early runs. And you'll see the parachutes working here. There goes the high-speed chute. And that little antenna on the side there, that was our uh, citizen's band radio. And then you'll see it, it'll drop the uh, high-speed chute, and you'll see the low-speed chute come out. Uh, that was just the sky and the salt and us. That place is, is as desolate as it looks. And there's Gary looking over the blue flame after setting the record at 630 miles an hour and getting ready to put the horse away dry.